الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاتي ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الإيمان بضع وسبعون شعبة أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام الحمد لله All praises are for Allah Azza wa Jalla We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all his blessings and his favors and his kindness that he has given to us and we beg Allah our creator, our nourisher, our sustainer to continue to protect us Take care of us, protect our family members, protect the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and protect the whole mankind. Indeed, Allah is the one, He is the Lord, He is the creator, He is the protector. And anyone who entrusts themselves in the care of Allah, Allah definitely takes care of them. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again and again has mentioned in the Holy Quran that in one ayah he says, وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ And whosoever places his trust in Allah, فَهُوَ حَسْبُ Then Allah is sufficient for him. Whoever places his trust in Allah's hands, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is sufficient for him. This is why in the Holy Quran, Allah tells us, from among the enemies that we can have, the most powerful enemy is Satan. He is the controller of every single enemy, whether the enemy is from man or jinn. Satan. All these uh, other beings that are powerful in the name of the jinns, the big jinns, the ifrit, big, massive jinns that do all these. Uh, cruel and unjust things on the face of the earth in the invisible world and inspiring human beings to do the same because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Satan is the one who inspires people to do wrong things in Surah Nas when Allah spoke about the what al khannas Allah says, Alladhi yuwaswisu fi sudurin nas. This khannas who is Satan, he prompts the person to do evil things. He whispers into the heart for people to do the wrong things. This is why Allah mentions in many passages, different passages, when he orders the believers to give sadaqat and to give zakat, Shaitan puts in their heart that they will become poor. So they refrain and they withhold from what? Giving zakat. And whatever Allah gives as a hukum and as a law, what happens, Shaitan, he actually attacks that. He counter attacks that and he comes with a different way. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari Alayhi Rahmah, that when the adhan is called, shaitan runs so far that he can't hear the adhan again. And he is so scared when he hears the adhan, and he is so frightened, he gives off a sound while he's running away. And when the adhan comes to an end, he comes back to the masjid. He comes back and he remains there. wa thuwiba. But when the iqamat starts, because the words of the iqamat, they are just like the adhan. When the iqamat starts, shaitan runs again. He runs far away. And when the iqamat comes to an end, he comes back. And he finds space in the gaps of the people who are performing salat. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, When you form your lines for salat, do not leave any space between. That's the space that shaitan fills up. And when he stands there, he begins to whisper into your heart and in your mind. 
And he says the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Uzkur kada, remember this, you are in Salat, and he's telling you, penetrating into your heart, remember this, Uzkur kada, remember that, Uzkur kada, and remember that, Lima lam yakun yathkur, and the man begins to remember all those things that he couldn't remember before, and all those things are in his Salat. And he causes the man to slip, to such an extent that the man does not even know what he had read and how many rakats he had read already. And this is the maqsad and the purpose of Satan, to make the man slip in his acts of worship. So at the end of salat, this servant who would think to himself that he, alhamdulillah, he has worshipped Allah, Satan has called his, caused his acts of worship to go in vain. So this is why in everything, Satan comes even in the good deeds that we are doing, every single good deed that we are doing, shaitan presents himself there to cause some sort of corruption of our deeds. So Satan, who has made a promise to Allah that he will misguide people, Allah says that he is your biggest enemy and he is the most powerful enemy. There is no enemy that is more powerful than Satan. He can, the Prophet says, he runs through you like how your blood flows. Why do you think a man, when he becomes angry, his veins start to swell? Shaitan is running through his blood. So wherever, and the other meaning of that hadith, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that wherever that blood can reach in your body, and your blood reaches every part, exactly there Shaitan can reach, and he reaches there. He reaches there. That Satan runs through the human body like your blood. So therefore the Prophet wasallam has given us many advice that when we become angry, what we should do? If you are standing, sit. And if you are sitting, lie down. The anger will go. If it still does not go, perform wuzu. Because that anger is from fire. Say Shaitan was created from fire. This is why this is the heat coming out from your head and your body. And if you perform wudu and still the anger does not go, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa says, take a bath. It is better for you to go and take a bath and take half an hour to do that rather than you kill somebody and you spend your time in jail for the rest of your life. This is a choice of person. Because in anger a man does so many wrong things all of, for all of these things now he regrets afterwards. So this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on certain occasions, when the companions came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said, Oh Prophet of Allah, awsini, advise me. The Prophet said, La taghdab, do not become angry. The companion said, Oh Prophet of Allah, advise me further. He said, La taghdab, do not become angry. On the third occasion, the companion said, Oh Prophet, if Allah advise me, he said, La taghdab, do not become angry. Subhanallah. Because shaitan works through people in different ways. And he comes through that way. So therefore, shaitan who is the most powerful enemy of man, who has been given the chance by Allah to try to misguide people, because that is what he asked for in the beginning. He said to Allah when he was cast out of paradise, he said, oh Allah, well, give me time to live until the day of resurrection. <laughs> so that's a long lifespan, isn't that so? From the time of before Adam, alayhi salam, we are still living and the qiyamah has not come as yet. And shaitan is still living on. So Allah says, granted. Because the granting of so many years will not save him from the punishment. So after he was given that lifespan to live until the day of resurrection, he will be destroyed until the day of, of, uh, on the day of resurrection. Why? Because the promise of Allah is that he will only live until that day. Allah says, that's my promise. To you, you will live until the day of resurrection. After Allah gave him that, and Allah does not go against his promise, he says, O oh Allah, since you have given me such a, life, a long lifespan, I will misguide all your servants. I will do that. He said, O oh Allah, because shaitan used to worship Allah. 
Shaitan never denied Allah. He never denied Allah. So kufr does not only consist of denial of Allah. Kufr consists of other things also. Shaitan is the one who worshipped Allah in every story of the seven stories of paradise. In the authentic traditions, it is mentioned that there was not a spot in all the stories of paradise except that shaitan had made sajda on that spot. He continued to be a leader above the angels. He lived in paradise. He was not in hell. He lived in paradise until after Allah created Adam alayhi salam. And then Allah ordered all the angels to out of respect bow before Adam. Every angel did that. Satan said, I can't do that. I can't do that, Allah. Because this man, Adam, a human being, you have created from clay. And you have created me from fire. And the quality of clay is to go down. And the quality of fire is to rise. And a khayru minhu, I am better than this man. How can I bow before this man if I am better than him? That's what he said to Allah. He opposed Allah. He challenged Allah. I am better than him. Allah says, get out from here. And from today on, you shall be ar rajim the accursed one. So he is ar rajim the accursed one. And that is when he asked. He says, oh Allah, you have already made your decision. You have already expelled me and kicked me out of paradise. I am not asking to come back. You have already made the decree, I will be the accursed one until the day of judgment. I am not asking for that name to be moved. All I am asking you is give me respite until the day of resurrection. That's all. So Allah granted him. So when he, Allah says us in the, to, to us in the Quran, all these evil promptings that come, every single thought that comes in our mind to do something wrong, it is from shaitan. Then the body and the mind and the heart processes that and the actions then come from the limbs of the body. Allah says, so when shaitan and Satan touches any one of you with, the, with his touch, when he touches any one of you with his touch by coming to inspire you to do something wrong, by bringing an evil thought in your mind, by bringing his evil promptings, the waswasa, and throwing it in your heart, and telling you in your heart to do this and do that, and do not do this and do not do that, from among the good deeds. And he makes it, and he tries to force you, because you, you feel, as the human being, that the inclination towards wrong is dominant in you. You feel you can't control yourself, because it is dominant. And the, the effect of shaitan is stronger on someone who doesn't do good deeds because he's already weak in Iman. So there is nothing to defend him from shaitan. He's already weak. So it is easier for shaitan to take full hold of him than one who is already rebelling against shaitan. And every time shaitan comes, he says, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim Oh Allah, I seek your protection. Protect me from this accursed being. And Allah protects him. But the one who has already been misguided, it is easy for shaitan to cause them to stray and stray and stray and carry them where he wants to carry them in the fire of hell. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whenever Satan touches any one of you with his evil touch, then immediately you seek refuge in Allah and entrust yourself in the care of Allah because you do not have the power to protect yourself against shaitan. You don't have that, Allah says. This is why Allah says immediately, as soon as Satan comes to you and he prompts you and he puts evil things in your heart, don't try to play, as we say in our language, Mr. Brave. You feel you are doing all these salat night and day. You are waking up for the entire night. You have done so much hajj and umrah. And you read Quran for the whole day, you feel you are powerful, now you can fight shaitan. Allah says you can't do that. Shaitan came to Adam and he was a Nabi. <laughs> Who are you? Subhanallah. You are just a normal human being. Shaitan came and he deceived Adam alayhi salam. 
who was a Nabi of Allah. So Allah says, you can't, don't ever think that you are powerful to conquer him. And you are powerful to do this. And you are powerful to protect yourself. And you are not calling on Allah for protection. And you are thinking yourself, you will do this and you will do that. Allah says, no, shaitan will trick you right there. And he will get control of you. So Allah says in the Quran, and when that happens, immediately entrust yourself in the care of Allah. And Allah will take care of you. Allah will protect you. Because Allah is the only one who can protect you and take care of you against all these evil harms that can come from shaitan, whether they are manifest or whether they are invisible. Whether you can see them with your eyes or you can feel them but you can't see them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can protect you. So this is why we started by saying Allah says, and whosoever places his trust in Allah and he relies fully on Allah and he humbles himself to Allah and says, Oh Allah, I can't take care of myself. Oh Allah, I have no strength in myself to protect my own self against all the evils that surround me, all these harms that surround me. Oh Allah, I entrust myself into your care. You take care of me and Allah will surely take care of that person. Subhanallah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us that. The hadith which I indicated to in the beginning, it's a very beautiful hadith which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about the branches of it. But close to that, there is the hadith which I would like to quote to you. Very beautiful lesson in the hadith. Where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith which has been recorded by Imam Tirmizi Alaihi Rahma, where on one occasion the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the Sahabas, Istahyu min Allahi haqq al haya. He said, and whatever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the Sahabas, they were the Ummah at that time. He was saying to the whole Ummah. So we as Muslims, and no Muslim did that before, divide between those teachers and say that this was for them and not for us. Just as we cannot say the Quran was revealed about them and to them, this is for them and not for us. We can't say that. They happened to be the ones alive at that time. They were living. Allah chose them to be the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. So whatever they was revealed, whatever was revealed, they were the first addresses. We came afterwards. But when the Prophet ﷺ spoke, it was advice to the whole Ummah, to you and I also. When Allah revealed in the Quran, they were the first addresses. So they had to immediately practice on whatever Allah revealed. But the Quran was revealed equally to us. And we have to practice on it also. So the Prophet ﷺ said to them, He says, show modesty to Allah. Show haya to Allah. Show modesty to Allah just as is the right of modesty towards Allah. Istahyu min Allahi haqq al haya. Show haya. Haya is a word that is used in the Arabic language. Based in the context, the context in which it is used, the meaning may change. But most of the time, haya means modesty. That shame within a person. That modest characteristic in a person that will prevent him from doing everything that is detested and disliked by people and that is wrong. That trait in an individual which makes him naturally dislike something. It is what? Haya. For example, you might not want to do something publicly. What will be the reason? People are looking at you and you feel shy. What, what is making you not do that in public? Why is that thought coming to you? Because you have haya. You have haya. You might be in your home. Just look at these small examples. Probably you might have a vest because you are within the household. Your family members are there. Your wife is there. Your parents. But somebody says, brother so-and-so has come to meet you. Will you go out like that? You will say, let me put on a shirt. Isn't that so? And button up properly. Now, 
what you are wearing is good enough to be inside, but why won't you come out like that and meet a, a stranger? Because you have haya, you don't want to be seen like that. That is haya. Everybody, they will talk on the road and they will scream out in their talking and laughter and they will call out and they are not bothered about anybody. But as a Muslim, you say, me behaving like that, I can't bring my, my, myself to that. What is causing, what is stopping you? Haya. Haya. You don't want to do something because you, gener you just dislike it. People don't do it because it is dislike. The characteristic and the trait within a man that stops him from reprehensible acts, actions that are abhorred and hated by people, that characteristic that stops you is called haya, modesty, shame, modesty. That, and the Prophet ﷺ said that that haya that you have is part of your iman, subhanallah. That is part of your iman. The more haya you have, it shows it's the more iman you have. And the more iman you have, it means the more haya you will have. So this is why a believer, once he's a believer, he will not use obscene language because he cannot bring himself. The same tongue where he will say, Allahu Akbar, the same tongue he uses to say, Subhanallah, how can he bring obscene language on the tongue? He says, I can't do that. Haya is stopping him from that. He wouldn't bring a foul word on the tongue and say something that sounds really bad. He wouldn't do that. Even if he's angry, he still would not say that. He's angry, he's having a quarrel, still he will hold back and he will say, he might be tempted to say it, but then he will say, no, I can't say that, brother. <laughs> you, let's end it right here. I don't want to say what I really want to say. So the thought may come in the heart, but because of haya, it stops him from saying those things. That is haya. And the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, he said, Al Imanu bid'un wa sabu'una shu'ba. He said, Iman itself, the Iman that we have in our hearts, the Iman that came to us, given to us by Allah, has more than 70 branches. More than 70 branches of Iman. He says, Abdaluha qawlu la ilaha illallah. The highest branch of Iman is to say, La ilaha illallah. There is nothing higher than that. The most virtuous branch, the best branch, because these words are written on the arsh of Allah. This is the one statement that changed the human race from the time of Adam alayhi salam. And it changed a person from disbelief and made him a believer, subhanallah. This is the word when it when is uttered, it will move your destiny from Jahannam to Jannat, subhanallah. This is the word. If a man lived for 100 years as an unbeliever, saying there is no God, there is no God, and one day in the state of sanity and consciousness, he says, La ilaha illallah. I believe there is only one God, Allah. Subhanallah, 100 years of his is wiped out. Subhanallah, now he's a believer. He walks on the path of Jannah. That is the power. This is why that is the greatest kalima. The greatest kalima, la ilaha illallah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, wa adnaha. And the smallest branch, but of iman, is imatatul adha an it tariq. It is to remove something harmful from the pathway. That is part of your iman. In other words, that's how a believer thinks. A believer will not be walking on a street and, for example, see a broken bottle. And he thinks to himself, you know, if a child walks here without any shoes or slippers, he will get cut. The believer will take that and remove that. Moving a harmful object from the pathway is part of your iman, the Prophet ﷺ says. A believer is not selfish that he is concerned only about himself. He is concerned about the welfare of other people. Do not, the prophets, do not do things to cause harm to people. And if you see anything that is going to cause harm to people and you have the ability to move it, move it. Subhanallah. In hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari in our dars this morning, it's mentioned that this person, Sahih Hadith, the man, was walking on a pathway, like a track. 
And on that track, there was a tree with a thorny branch. And the thorny branch extended on the pathway. And every time someone passed on that pathway, they were pricked by the thorny branch. It will pull their clothing, or they will have to duck, or they will move it. The man stood up and he watched it. He says, Hatha, you are the nurse. This thorny branch with so many thorns on it, it is really causing harm to people. The man went home. He took a knife. He came back and he cut it. The hadith says, the Prophet said, فَشَكَرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ Allah was pleased with him. فَغَفَرَ لَهُ Allah forgave him. وَأَدْخَلَهُ الْجَنَّةِ Allah entered him into paradise. Subhanallah. What? For a small deed. Huh? Removing a harmful object from the pathway of people. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, that is a branch of Iman. So we are believers. We must never think that that is too low for us to bend down and pick up something that will cause harm to people. It can be in your home also. It can be coming to the masjid. It can be in the masjid. But that is part of the Iman. That is not outside Iman. Then at the end of the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, وَالْحَيَاءُ شُعْبَةٌ مِّنَ الْإِيمَانِ And Haya, modesty is part of your Iman. That is a, a part of your Iman. Once you have Iman, Haya is there. And if a person has Iman and Haya is not there, then he needs to search his Iman again. Whether what he has is real Iman or not. On one occasion, the Prophet Wasallam, Imam Bukhari has mentioned the tradition also, was passing on the road and he heard one Ansari, a uh, companion telling another Ansari. He was Kathirul Haya, one person, he had a lot of haya. So the more haya you have, you will find that that individual will refrain from something. He will always refrain. Sometimes he may not want to talk for people to hear because he's, as they will call it, shy. He feels bad. He doesn't want to do it. He feels shy. He doesn't want to do this. Haya in him. So this is why Imam Bukhari mentioned in the chapter of Ilm, he says if you have naturally, have a natu you have naturally haya, a lot of haya, now, when you have haya, you don't like to talk to be heard. You know, you don't like to say something that people will hear. They will say so and so, you know, how people are, they feel shy. So he said, if you have so much shyness and you can't do anything about it, Allah has placed it there and you want to ask a question. And you fear that people may hear and you, wouldn't want, you, feel, you feel bad about it. Ask somebody to ask the person. And he quoted the narration from Ali radiallahu ta'ala. Now, Ali radiallahu ta'ala was the son-in-law of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He got married to Fatima. And Ali wanted to ask a question. It was a personal question. But he was too shy to ask the Prophet. Why? Because the Prophet's daughter was his wife. So he sent another person by the name of Maqdar. He says, go and ask the Prophet. But don't tell him it's me. So he went there. He asked the question and he came back and he told Ali radiallahu ta'ala. And Imam Bukhari showed that the haya exists also even in ilm and knowledge. But don't deprive yourself from knowledge because of your haya, you know, your modesty. Put someone to ask if you can ask. But it goes to show that that should be and must be part of the believer's life, haya. So this one sahabi was telling the other one who was having a lot of haya, he says, you have too much haya. <laughs> too much. Anta kathirul haya. Leave off having so much haya and modesty and shyness. When the Prophet ﷺ said that, heard that, he said, Da'ahu, leave him. Leave him with his haya and modesty and that amount of shyness. Fa inna al haya min al iman. Because haya is part of iman. If he has so much haya, that represents the amount of iman he has. If he has, the more iman he has, the more haya he, he will have. And the more haya he has is the more iman he has. The Prophet ﷺ said, leave him. They can't be having too much haya. You have it, alhamdulillah. So this is why haya in a person must be shown to Allah also. It must be shown to Allah. And in the hadith I quoted, recorded by Imam Tirmizi alayhi rahma, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was telling the sahabas that. He said, Istahyu min Allahi haqqal haya. Show modesty to Allah. Be modest to Allah. Have haya towards Allah in the manner that you are fulfilling the rights of haya. The sahaba said, O Messenger of Allah, Inna nastahyi, alhamdulillah. They said, alhamdulillah, O Prophet of Allah, we have modesty towards Allah. 
We show haya towards Allah. Haya has a mean of humbleness also, humility. The Prophet ﷺ says, Laysa kathalik. He says, this is not what I mean. What you say you have haya, this is not what I mean. He says, walakin, he says, let me explain to you what is showing haya to Allah. When it is said that you must show modesty and be modest to Allah, what does it mean? He said, walakin al-istihya min Allahi haqq al haya." Show in haya towards Allah. Show in that type of modesty and shyness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In accordance to the rights of haya is that what? One, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَن تَحْفَظَ الرَّعْسُ وَمَا hawa That protect your head and what goes in your head. First sign of haya to Allah. First sign of haya. Protect your head and what goes in your head. What does it mean? It protects all those thoughts that are processed in your brain, in the head. You know, we normally refer, once you have a thought, we say, I have something in my head. <laughs> You're thinking about something in your head. What is the Prophet ﷺ says? Protect your head and your mind and your heart from these evil thoughts that come in. Evil thoughts creep in. Bad things creep in. A talk that brings about sinful action, it enters the heart. It enters the mind. It is in the brain. And sometimes so many wrong and evil thoughts creep in during the day and the night. And we allow them to come in. And sometimes we entertain them also. You know, and we allow our brains to process. And we have so many wrong things in our head. The prophet says the first sign, if you are modest to Allah, is you will protect your head and what goes into your head. Let good things go in the head. Don't entertain hatred and enmity for people. Do not have ill thoughts and bad thoughts about people. Do not do that. Let good things go into the head so good things will come out from the head. Subhanallah. That's the first. The Prophet ﷺ said, وَالْبَطَنْ وَمَا وَعَى The second sign of showing haya to Allah and modesty to Allah. Protect your stomach and what goes in it and what is contained in your stomach. Meaning what? Protect your stomach from haram going into it. Be careful of what you eat and drink. Let it not be haram. Because if haram goes in, evil will come out. When halal goes in, taqwa will come out. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah has revealed the same law to the believers as he had revealed to the anbiyas and the prophets. And he said, eat and drink that which is pure and wholesome. وَعَمَلُوا صَالِحَا And do good deeds. Because when you put good in your body, good will come out. When you put bad in your body, bad will come out. So the Prophet said, this is a sign that you will be showing haya to Allah. Because when we stand before Allah, Allah does not look at the faces, how colorful the faces may be, how pretty or handsome the faces will be, how beautiful our garments will be. Allah's sight penetrates into the heart and He looks at the heart and He looks at the mind. So a person will not be showing haya to Allah if he stands with a good face and a dirty heart. That's not haya to Allah. You know, if you have done, it's, you have actually a lot of evil in your heart. If you have a lot of evil in your heart for somebody and the person knows that through authentic evidence, Maybe he heard you talking to somebody else. And he knows you have it. And when you meet him, Salaamu Alaikum brother, how are you? MashaAllah, long time I haven't seen you. You are such a nice brother. What do you do? When you know he has a lot of ill thoughts for you, and he's a wicked person at heart towards you, you say, do you don't have any shame brother? That's what you're going to say. Isn't that so? You have no haya, that's what you are saying. It means on your face, it's smiling, but your heart is dirty and wicked. So when we stand before Allah with beautiful girl clothing and a nice face and Allah sees the blackness of the heart, He will say, you have no haya? How can you, you know, come like that? You have to clean within. You have to clean your heart because I am seeing your heart. I am looking at your heart 
I am seeing what other people can see. So come to me with internal purity and external purity because I am watching inside. This is the message that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, with respect to our stomach, and that is our responsibility, my dear beloved brothers and sisters, that whatever we eat and we drink, we must ensure that it is halal and wholesome and it is good. And it is not doubtful and it is not haram. And the third sign, the third sign of having haya and showing modesty to Allah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَأَن تَذْكُرَ الْمَوْتُ وَالْبَلَاءُ that you remember your death and remember your life after the death. What's going to happen to you? Remember that. Don't live a life of unmindfulness and you don't even think about what's going to happen after. And lo and behold, that comes to you and you are unprepared. The Prophet ﷺ says, if you have haya towards Allah, you will think about that and what, is full, what will follow after that. Your life in the grave, your life in barzakh, you're standing before Allah. And if a person thinks about these things, it will help him to mend his ways and do that which is right. The Prophet at the end of the hadith, he said, Man fa'ala thalika, whosoever has done these three things, faqad istahya min Allahi haqqal haya, then he has indeed shown modesty to Allah in accordance to the rights of haya and modesty. So this hadith gives us a beautiful teaching my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters and something we didn't know but we all learn that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has ordered us that we also have to show haya to allah we have to show modesty to allah also and how do we do that that is what he has explained to us in the hadith may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and protect us and give us the ability to make amal on these beautiful teachings of our rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wala akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen His face So beautiful